I hope to hear a warm welcome. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Welcome to, welcome to our 20-something program of this year. Yes, we've already done 20 plus programs. So many, I can't even really keep track of what's been going on. And we still have several to go before we even reach the midpoint of this year. Two weeks ago, we were in Charlotte, North Carolina for our first time in North Carolina. Over 100 people attended that program. A few weeks before that, we were in Birmingham, Alabama. The first time that we were in Alabama, and that too, over 100 people attended that program. We have a program coming up in Atlanta, Georgia in three weeks. Currently, as of today, 192 people are registered to attend that program. So there is a need, and while there is a need for our type of program, we are gonna keep applying with the pharmaceuticals to do this and get the grants to do the programs in those areas. And that is what we do. We provide MS information, education, and resources for all affected by MS. So if you don't know, we hope that you'll visit our website and you'll learn more from what we are doing right now. Tonight's program is made possible by Genzyme, a Santa Fe company. Without their grant, we would not be doing tonight's program. So I want to thank them, and I hope you all do as well. For those that don't know, Genzyme is the maker of Abagio, and Abagio is one of your oral medications, and I'm sure you'll hear some of it tonight as well. In addition, though, to Genzyme, we have other sponsors of the program. That includes Accorda Therapeutics. Accorda makes Ampira. Ampira is known to many as the walking pill. Then we also have Biogen IDEC. Biogen IDEC makes Avonex, Tysabri, and Tecfidera. Teva Neuroscience makes Copaxone. Allergan makes Botox, and you might hear about that tonight as well. NSCFF is here, and NSCFF is now offering their own programs in the community. You might want to know more about them, or you might already know Tamara. If you don't, please see Tamara after the program. And also, our final sponsor of tonight's program is QuestCore Therapeutics. QuestCore makes Acthar Gel. Okay, it's actually QuestCore Pharmaceuticals. I messed up with QuestCore Therapeutics. It's okay, you all understand, all right? All right, I'm not going to be speaking a lot tonight. We all are tired. It's nighttime. We want to get started on the program. Our first speaker tonight is Brian Steingo. For those that don't, don't know Brian Steingo, Brian Steingo is right here. Brian is um, the medical director of the MS Center of Pompano Beach. He's very well known. He does a lot of programs, and I'm sure you all will learn a lot from what he's going to present tonight. After Dr. Steingo, Christopher Gomez is seated at the front table here, and he will be speaking about the urologic dysfunctions of multiple sclerosis. We have never used Dr. Gomez speak at our programs, but I've heard he's so great, I wanted to have him here tonight. So I hope you all welcome him as well. So without any further ado, let's get started on tonight's program. And now I'm not gonna talk anymore, because now it's Dr. Gomez's time. Thank you. And those that don't remember, he's gonna introduce himself. if I can get this to work. All right. So uh, as he said, uh, I, I'm Chris Gomez. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. I think this is a, oh, maybe I'll have to hold it. Uh, this is a great opportunity, a, a great group. And, and tonight, I could spend hours on, on this subject. I'm really passionate uh, about it. It's what I love to, to do. But I'm going to try and cover as much as possible in 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, I have a tendency to get overexcited and, and talk a little fast. So if I'm talking too fast, throw a dinner roll at me, some butter or something, and I'll slow down a, a little bit. So really, uh, you know, who am I and what do I do? So I'm a urologist by, by training, and I specifically deal with patients with urinary incontinence and, and voiding dysfunction. Uh, but more specifically, I'm a, a neurourologist, and that doesn't mean that I'm a neurologist and a urologist. Uh, what it means is, is that I'm a urologist that has specific training treating patients with neurologic diseases. And the majority of my patients uh, have either spinal cord injuries or, or multiple sclerosis, and I deal specifically with the urologic complications. Uh, involved uh, with with those diseases. So so why am I here? Why did why did I, I come and talk at an MS uh, group if I'm a urologist? Well, that that's the fact that 80% of patients with multiple sclerosis have some urinary symptoms. And in fact, if you look at patients over 10 years after their diagnosis, 95% of patients will have some abnormal urologic findings. So if you don't have urinary symptoms now, there is a chance in the future that you may need a, a urologist. 
Before I get started on, on the other parts of the talk, I'd just like to go over some definitions of what I'm going to be talking about. And the first is urinary incontinence, and, and that's just the involuntary loss of urine. This is when you have an accident of the urine, it comes out when you, when you don't want it to. Of urinary incontinence, we have two broad categories that we can divide it into. And one is stress urinary incontinence. This is when you cough, laugh, sneeze, or if you're in a wheelchair, when you transfer from the wheelchair to a bed and you lose urine, this is what we call stress urinary incontinence. The second broad category that we have is what we call urgency urinary incontinence. This is when you really have a strong desire to urinate, you're trying to run to get to the bathroom, and before you can get there, you can't control it, and the urine comes out uh, when you don't want it to. Another common term that you hear is what we call overactive bladder. And overactive bladder simply is that urgency to, to urinate. When you really have a strong desire to get there, you feel like you have to run to the get, get to the bathroom. And if you don't run to get there, you may leak some urine. It can be associated with incontinence. Most commonly, it's associated with urinary frequency, so you feel like you're going to the bathroom more than the average person. And lastly, the opposite of, of these previous uh, definitions is urinary retention. This is just difficulty emptying the bladder, not being able to completely empty in it. And it varies from complete retention, meaning you can't urinate at all and you have to use a catheter to empty your bladder, or that you can empty your bladder 90%, but not all of it, it can come out. And when I talk to patients, when I talk to medical students, residents uh, that I teach, I try and break urinary symptoms into two broad categories. And this is failure to store and failure to empty. And MS patients are unique in that they often have a combination uh, of the two. So you often have storage symptoms, which are those irritative symptoms, the frequency, the urgency, and the incontinence. And then you have emptying symptoms, which is difficult to urinate uh, and to get the, the urine out. So the first subject I'm going to talk about is the failure to empty or the urinary retention. Uh, and really, this is present in 25% of the patients, so it's not as frequent uh, as the storage symptoms, but it's still pretty prevalent uh, among MS patients. And there's two main causes that can cause this urinary retention. And we really have to look at how a normal person would, would void that doesn't have retention. And what happens when you're going to the bathroom is that the detrusor muscle, which is the muscle of the bladder, contracts, and that forces the urine out. But as well, simultaneously, the sphincter muscle, which is within the urethra, has to relax to allow that urine to come out. So there's two possible causes on why you can't empty your bladder. One is that that muscle of the bladder may not be able to contract properly and empty out the urine, or it may be contracting properly, or that sphincter muscle can't relax. So the bladder contracts, the sphincter stays closed, and the, and the urine can't, can't come out. Uh, how do we check if you're having urinary retention? And I think one of the, the most important tests for, for patients to have is what we call a post-void residual measurement. And this is where we have you go to the bathroom, you try and empty out your bladder completely. We have you come back to the room, and we do a quick ultrasound uh, of your bladder with a small machine, and we check how much urine is left in, in your bladder. And a lot of you will tell me, well, I feel like I can completely empty my bladder. I don't have the, this problem. Well, when we looked at MS patients, and we actually did this test uh, on everybody, almost half of the patients who said they didn't have any problems emptying their bladder actually had some significant retention uh, of urine. So it can be a silent symptom. Uh, though you don't feel, but does have long-term implications for your, for your health. Another test that's pretty commonly ordered for MS patients by urologists is some called urodynamics. And this I, I, I correlate to an EKG for your heart, but it's just for your bladder. And this has given us the function uh, of the bladder for you. So what we do is we put a small catheter in the bladder, we fill it up with water, and we can measure the pressure of the bladder, how the bladder functions, if the bladder's having spasms, and then we ask you to urinate. We can measure how well the bladder contracts and if the sphincter relaxes. So this really tells us what the function of your bladder is, how much it can hold, what the pressures inside the bladder are, and this really helps dictate a lot of what our treatments are, are going to be for you. So how do we treat urinary retention and difficulty emptying? Well, really the gold standard uh, of treating this uh, is what we call intermittent catheterization. So if you're not able to empty out your bladder at all, uh, your physician may ask you to insert a small catheter into the bladder, help drain out, drain out the bladder. Uh, it takes less than a minute to do, and it can vary from how frequent you have to do it depending on how much urine you retain. It can be from once a day to up to six times a day. Uh, now, if you have difficulty relaxing the sphincter, 
but your bladder muscle does work, uh, then we have some medications which can help relax that sphincter for you, make it easier for you to urinate. Some are oral medications, and one that I'll talk about a little bit later is Botox injections into the sphincter, which will help relax those muscles and help you empty your bladder a little bit later. So really the question is, why should we treat urinary retention? Well, that retention of urine often leads to the frequency and urgency and those storage symptoms that you can have. You can imagine if you're walking around all day with your bladder half full, it's going to fill up faster, you're going to have to go to the bathroom faster, and it's going to lead to a lot of urgency and irritation uh, of the bladder. And we see that if we can get you to empty your bladder better, we relieve a lot of that frequency, urgency, and we can even relieve some of your incontinence that you have where we can get you to empty your bladder a little bit better. The second is more, not so much of a, a quality of life issue, but really a medical health issue. And one of the problems if you're retaining urine is that pressure can build up inside the bladder. So if your bladder is constantly full, pressure can build up inside the bladder, and that pressure can get transmitted to the kidneys. Uh, this can lead to renal failure if it's not treated properly. It's less common for this to happen in MS patients compared to other neurologic diseases, but it's still a possibility. It's more common to happen in men than, than in women. Um, so men definitely who have some incomplete emptying their bladder should be screened with at least a, a renal ultrasound and, and urodynamics by their urologist. Another problem with ret retention of urine is that it leads to increased urinary tract infections. So if we can help you empty your bladder a little bit better, we may be able to decrease those urinary tract infections. And we know that urinary tract infections are a big trigger uh, for MS relapse uh, and symptoms. So this really becomes an important issue uh, in your overall MS care. So for the first part of the talk, some of the take home points uh, is that urinary retention can be dangerous to your health. Uh, I think it causes a significant amount uh, of irritated and storage bothersome symptoms. Uh, one of the biggest hurdles I have is actually convincing patients to start catheterization. Um, patients see it as a big burden for them, and I agree it is somewhat a, of, a, of a burden. Uh, but we're doing it for your own good and for your symptom relief. And once patients start catheterization, uh, they're very grateful for it because a lot of them, it really relieves their, their symptoms and they haven't felt better after it. So if your urologist uh, wants you to start catheterization, spend the time with them, try and learn how to do it. And I think a lot of people are gonna be happy uh, afterwards. The second half of my talk, I'm gonna talk more about the, the storage symptoms. Uh, which mainly consists of urinary frequency and urgency. And this is present in about 65% of MS patients to some degree. Uh, and urinary incontinence, which was that involuntary loss of urine having those accidents, uh, the urgency incontinence running to get to the bathroom happens in about 45% of patients. And the stress incontinence with coughing, laughing, sneezing ha happens in about 25% of the patients. So who's going to have urinary symptoms? Well, we don't have a good predictor of it. Dr. Steingo was showing the EDSS score, which was your overall functional score. And we looked at, if we look at that score, we look at the severity uh, of your symptoms uh, and your overall function, we can't predict who's going to have these urinary symptoms in, in the future. We know that urinary symptoms do increase with the disease duration. And if you're diagnosed at an older age, you tend to have more urinary, more urinary symptoms. One of the most important things I'm going to say today is you are your best advocate. Dr. Skyngo sort of went over his list that he has you write down at the beginning of an office visit. And I want to highlight the point that patients who have significant urinary urgency and urinary symptoms will only refer to a urologist less than half of the time. And even those patients with significant urinary symptoms started medical therapy about half of the time. So you are your best advocate. If something's bothering you, you need to speak up about it. You have a lot of other medical issues going on that your neurologist is trying to take care of, your primary care physician is trying to take care of. If you don't let them know how you feel, nobody can fix it for you. So this is probably one of the most important points that I, I'm gonna go over today. This is really a passionate issue for me because urinary incontinence and urinary symptoms are all about quality of life to me. We know that urinary incontinence can be embarrassing. It can affect intimacy with, uh, amongst couples. And that fear of leakage on a daily basis leads to a significant amount of anxiety. And people who have really significant urinary problems start to change their daily routines and their daily behaviors. I have patients who won't go out of their house just because of their urinary incontinence. If they go out of their house, they make sure they know exactly where every single bathroom is on their, on their trip there. 
They change their, their clothes so you can't see them leaking. They start to wear pads and diapers. Uh, they, they decrease their socialization with their friends because of the embarrassment of it. So this really is all about quality of life. Not only is it quality of life, but there's significant morbidity associated with urinary incontinence. And we look at patients who have frequency, urgency, and leakage of urine. There's a 26% increased risk of falls because you're always rushing to get to the bathroom, as well as 34% increase of fractures. So not only is it quality of life, but it really does improve your, your morbidity uh, overall for getting this treated. So what can we do to help this? Well, there's a lot of self-directed therapy that we can do, and I think a lot of it overlaps with some of the, the points that Dr. Steingo went over, and I'll go over some of the diets and exercises that we can do to help. So really, the, the non-pharmacologic, the non-medication uh, therapies that we can do for you starts with a, with a diet. And one of the most important things is to look at your fluid consumption. And I say here, a reasonable daily intake of fluid. Uh, what that means is patients come to me and they, they say, Doc, I'm urinating all day, all the time. So I have them write down for a 24-hour period when they have something to drink, when they urinate, and what the volume of their fluid intake is. And I find out that they drank three liters of iced tea during the, the day and they're complaining that they're urinating too much. Well, that, that clearly is a, an intake of, of fluid volume. The more you drink, the more you're going to have to urinate. And I'm okay with that as long as you understand, understand that in that relationship. For people who have significant urination at night, they're waking up three to four times a, a night, we try and restrict the fluids in the evening. And this is especially important for people who are, are busy working and busy with hobbies during the day. I know myself, I'm at work most of the day, I don't have time to drink, I get home from work, and I consume 90% of my liquids in the evening. Now obviously, if you're consuming the majority of your liquids in the evening, you're gonna get up to urinate at, at night. So we try and space out your fluid consumption evenly throughout the day. Try and start restricting your fluids at night if nighttime urination is a problem for you. Now there's definitely some offenders uh, that you can try and mark off your list. Caffeine and alcohol are probably the two major offenders. Caffeine and alcohol by themselves are irritants of the bladder. Not only are they irritants of the bladder, but they're diuretic. So they're gonna cause you to produce more urine than you normally would if you're just drinking water. Uh, as well, artificial sweeteners can irritate the bladder. And for some patients, acidic foods can really irritate the bladder. So I'm not asking you to cut out all fruits and vegetables, obviously, but there's a list of acidic fruit fruits and foods, uh, tomato, tomatoes are a major offender, and just pay attention to your diet when you eat certain foods. If you find that your urinary symptoms are worse, try and eliminate those and cut those out. Now another thing that you can do on your own is starting a daily exercise uh, routine. We know that patients have improved bladder health just with a daily light physical exercise routine, and it's really strength flexibility and mobility that, that help. Uh, there's a plethora of videos that are available online specifically for MS patients for all levels of, of function, uh, whether you're in a wheelchair or highly, highly functional. Some light physical activity every day, which helps improve weight loss and urinary symptoms, uh, really is a significant way to, to start and start improving your bladder health. Pelvic floor exercises specifically for bladder health are really important. This is important for both men and women. Uh, we know that if you strengthen the muscles in the pelvis that support the bladder, support the prostate, and the female pelvic organs, uh, that you really will have decreased urinary frequency and urgency, uh, decreased rates of urinary incontinence, and specifically for women, you decrease your chance of pelvic organ prolapse, which is either the uterus or the bladder dropping down in the, in the pelvis. So this really is important uh, for you to start this. Uh, poise which makes the poise pads. Whoopi Goldberg had a very famous commercial during one of the Super Bowls for it. Uh, they've done a very good job of putting out some educational videos. Uh, I think yoga and Pilates is probably one of the best exercises to do for strengthening the pelvic floor. Uh, all these exercises are readily available on their website. It's on their Australian website, which is poise.com.au. Uh, but all these exercises are very easy to do. Uh, they have about 10 different videos. Uh, they've even made them for pregnant women, so your level of mobility doesn't have to be very high to do it. But this is probably the, the best exercise you can do to strengthen the pelvic floor. Uh, if you need a little bit of extra help, there are specific pelvic floor physical therapists which can help you. I know we have a number at, at the University of Miami and there's some in the community, but if you really need that extra help for the exercise, there are specific 
physical therapist, which can help you with the, these exercises. So what happens when the, these treatments don't work, when you've changed your diet, started the exercises, and you're still having urinary symptoms? Well, typically what we do is we start you on an oral medication, and this is just a list of some of the oral medications uh, that we have. Uh, starting in the 1970s, these were our only options up until a couple of years ago. More recently, in the past year, we came out with a new oral medication, which is the first new class of oral medications since the 1970s. And then I'll go over some other treatments that we have as well. But these medications work on the bladder by decreasing the frequency and urgency for you. So they try and quiet down the bladder and the nerves in the bladder to help give you a little bit more time to get to the bathroom and to go a little bit less. Uh, you know, we ask that you try and use an extended release formula. So this is taking it one time a day instead of having to take it multiple times a day. And we usually start at the lowest dose because that has the lowest side effects for you. Even with trying to use a once daily dosing and a medication with the lowest side effects, there still is a very high discontinuation rate uh, of these medications. And at six months, about half the patients have stopped them, either because they no longer want to take an oral medication, they have some adverse side effects, or they feel like the medication's really not working for them. So what do we do when the medications don't work? And we have two main treatment options when the medications don't, don't work. One of them is Botox therapy, which uh, Allergan is here tonight uh, as a sponsor. Uh, and this we can use for the overactive bladder, the going too frequently and difficulty to control, as well as injecting into the sphincter to help you empty the bladder a little bit better. Uh, and the second therapy that we have is something we call neuromodulation. So this is directly targeting the nerves that go to the, the bowel and the bladder to help improve both your urinary frequency, urgency, and help empty the bladder. And one of the unique aspects of the neuromodulation therapy is that the nerves that go to the bladder are the same nerves that go to the bowel. So we can target one group of nerves, and for patients who have difficulty controlling both their bladder and their bowels, this is a potential therapy uh, that can target both of those with, with one treatment. So Botox, I think most people are, are common with Botox treatment for, for aesthetics and, and facial, and it's the exact same principle. We're injecting Botox into the muscle of the bladder to help relax the bladder, just like we do to inject into the face to take out the wrinkles. Uh, we do this in the office. It's about a 10-minute procedure to do. We use a small camera that looks inside the bladder, and then we use a small needle to inject into the bladder uh, the Botox medication. And this really revolutionized the, the treatment uh, of urinary incontinence for MS patients. And, and this is just a, an example of one of the studies that was done in MS patients. Uh, and you can see that it increased the bladder capacity. This is how much volume you can hold in your bladder by 300%. So patients who had Botox injections were able to hold 300 times more in their bladder than they were previously to the, the injection. It decreased the amount of times they went to the bathroom almost in half, and it decreased the amount of urgent continence episodes that they had on a daily basis by three-fourths. So this really significantly reduced the urinary symptoms for MS patients, and these were all patients who had failed medical therapy. So one of the main risks uh, of Botox injection is, is urinary retention because we're, we're in a sense paralyzing the muscles to the bladder and the nerves going to the bladder that some people have some difficulty emptying afterwards. So we sort of modified our approach to this and, and I use a lower dose of Botox to start out with. And what we found is when we use that lower dose of Botox to start, the risk of urinary retention tends to be quite low. In this study, it was 16%. In my practice, it's 10% or, or less in the majority of patients. But what I'll say, a lot of my patients will take that trade-off. If patients have significant urinary incontinence, they're wearing diapers, wearing pads all day, they would rather have me completely paralyze their bladder to be able to control their urinary symptoms, and they'll take the trade-off of having to use a catheter intermittently because they can, they can schedule that on their daily basis. They can go out of the house, they can catheterize when they want to, but they don't have that fear of leakage. And this really is a detailed discussion that you have to have with your urologist before starting this treatment. I think the risk is relatively low. If 90% of my patients get benefit out of it and don't have to catheterize, I, I think that's really worth taking it. And the nice thing about it is the medication does wear off, so it's not a permanent urinary retention, but it's really worth, uh, worth a try when all, all else has failed. Uh, the second type of treatment that we have when the medic oral medications fail is, is the neural stimulation. And what we do here is we're stimulating the nerves to go to the bladder to either quiet them down 
or excite them to have you empty a little bit better. And what we do is we place a small needle next to the nerves that go to the bladder. And these are in the sacrum, which is near the, the tailbone uh, in your bottom. And we give you a test phase for one to two weeks to see if this works. So during this test phase, uh, you wear what looks like a little pager device. It's actually an external battery pack that you wear around. You can do all your normal daily, daily functions with this. And we want to see how this treatment works for you over one to two weeks. And this is really nice because you get an immediate feedback on whether or not this is going to work. If the treatment does work for you, we move on to the second phase uh, of the therapy, which is actually implantation of the, of the battery pack. It looks just like a pacemaker that somebody would have for their heart. You can see it's a little bit bigger than, than a quarter. Uh, it gets implanted uh, in the buttocks area, it's sort of out of the way. For most people, it doesn't bother them, them at all. But this really is a great therapy uh, for patients who have failed oral medications, and specifically for patients who have both fecal incontinence, that's difficulty controlling the, the bowels, and difficulty controlling the bladder because it's working on the same nerves that go to the both. Now, the therapy sounds great, but there's one major problem with it right now for MS patients, is that with implantation of this device, you cannot get an MRI. And I don't think there's probably a patient here with MS who hasn't had an MRI. So this is really a, a major problem with this device. I, I think it's an excellent device, uh, but I would not get this device implanted unless you have a detailed discussion both with your urologist and more specifically, your neurologist has to sign off on this for you because you have to be relatively stable and they have to feel like you will not need an MRI anytime soon. Now, if it's an absolute emergency, you can get an MRI, it's not a problem, but it still is contraindicated. Now, what I will say is that just this year, the same exact device was approved for pain management to have MRIs, and we expect sometime this year that this device will be MRI compatible. So I think still it is not an everyday tool that I use for MS patients, specifically because of this difficulty with MRIs. I use it for the exceptional patients uh, where I get approval from their neurologist, but I think later on in this year it's going to get MRI approval likely, and it's going to be something that's used more frequently in M MS patients. Uh, the last therapy that we have is very similar. Uh, to the inner stem device in the sacral neuromodulation. And it's working on the same principle that we're trying to stimulate the nerves to reprogram the nerves that go to the bladder. And this really is adapting acupuncture techniques that have been around for, for many years. And what we're doing is we're stimulating a nerve in the ankle called the tibial nerve. And this tibial nerve travels up to the sacral nerves, which then communicate with the bladder. So we're getting almost the same effect that we did with the implanted device, uh, but with a temporary device. So this device doesn't require any implantation. You come to the office, we place a small acupuncture needle near the nerve in the ankle, and we stimulate that nerve for 30 minutes. Uh, the downside to it is it requires multiple treatments. So typically, a treatment protocol is 12 weeks. You come once a week, it's a 30-minute treatment, uh, and then you come every, every week for that for 12 weeks. Uh, it is not painful, it's very easy. Uh, patients often bring a book and they read during the, the stimulation. It, it's very similar to getting acupuncture done, and for some people it, it's somewhat, somewhat relaxing. This is definitely a newer therapy. We don't have long-term results on it, and we haven't used it as frequently in the MS population as in other populations, but the results do seem promising. And in one small study that we had, it decreased the amount of times you went to the bathroom on day almost in half, and I think more importantly, it decreased the amount of incontinence episodes that patients had uh, in half. Now, one caveat to this is it did not completely cure any patients uh, of urinary incontinence. So although it decreased the number of incontinence epi episodes significantly, no patients were free of incontinence. But I think this is really a, a very, very low-risk procedure. It doesn't require an implant. Uh, it's very easy to do. The only downside to it is your time commitment. Uh, but I think this is really a, a great option for, for patients these days. So this, this sort of wraps up my, my talk. Uh, you know, I think I covered that urinary symptoms really are prevalent amongst the MS population. Uh, I think you really have to be uh, the biggest advocate for yourself, and you have to be out, outspoken about your symptoms. If you don't speak up about your symptoms, you're never going to get treatment for them. Uh, it's probably affecting your quality of life more than you think. A lot of patients adapt their daily behaviors slowly and they don't realize how much they've changed because of their urinary symptoms. And when we start to treat these symptoms, they really get appreci appreciation from it. Uh, I think the self-directed therapies that I went over with diet, 
pelvic floor exercise and just daily light physical exercise and, and weight loss uh, is an excellent start for, for everybody who, who's here. Uh, we have a plethora of medical therapies and, and treatment options are available. So if you've tried one therapy and, and things haven't worked, don't give up hope. I think there's still a lot of, of therapies out there, out there for you. And that is, that is it. Thank you for coming down. I'm sure there are many people here that appreciate what you spoke about, so thank you again. Now for Q&A, who's ready? You all know Anna, right? Yes. Yeah, everybody knows Anna. Okay, so I'm gonna start in the back of the room. Gentlemen, if you could take turns at the microphone, if you, for whoever shouts out a question before I get there, we're not gonna to get to your question. No, it's, it's all right. Listen, if, if somebody asks something and I don't get there in time, could you just re, you know, repeat what they're asking? Thank you. My question is, uh, about the swollen neck, you mentioned something about a doctor, and I, I don't know where it came from, but I know that it was mentioned in your presentation. Yeah, so what, what I talked about was not swollen neck as much as just a large neck. So that's one of the predictors that they use. When they're trying to predict if someone has a risk for sleep apnea, there are various things we look at, such as age, Gender, more common in males, snoring, hypertension, and neck size is one of the factors. That's what I was talking about. If a male has a neck size larger than 17, for example, or a female larger than 15, they have an increased risk for sleep apnea. You're welcome. For those that don't know, the video cameras are not looking back at you. They're only pointing forward. So again, if you, want, if you have a question that you want to ask, and you don't want to orally ask the question, you can write it down and give it to me, and, or give it to Mark. Mark, raise your hand. Give it to Mark, and we'll get around the room, and we'll pick up your questions as well. Um, hello, um, my, name is, my name is Johnson Jean Lewis. I want to direct this question to Dr. Gomez. Uh, you, you talked about several treatments um, for, for, for incontinence. Is there a copay for the um, for the for the Botox injection that you that you were discussing? It, there there is with any with any treatment there there is some uh, some cost to it. Uh, the nice thing is, is that the majority of insurance companies are are now covering uh, this therapy, and, and it varies significantly in cost from company uh, to company. Uh, but almost all insurance companies now are are covering this therapy. So we'd have to check with your individual plan, uh, but you can be fairly confident that it will be covered if you have failed other uh, medical therapies. Anybody else? Wait, just got a follow-up. Follow-up, what's a follow-up? A follow-up to his question. I, I might have missed it, but the Botox, how long does that last? Uh, so it varies for, for every patient. On average, it lasts about six months. Um, the shortest duration is about three months. Uh, I have some patients who go a, a year before they, they need a repeat injection. And the nice thing about it is uh, during that time, you're not taking a daily oral medication. So this is a way to get off a daily oral medication. Um, you get one injection on average every six months. And you save a little for the rest of the body? <laughs> <laughs> That's on the side. Hi. Um, I've been diagnosed with MS for over 31 years. Um, before being diagnosed, I had bladder problems. I couldn't control going to a bathroom. I would either go to a bathroom or just do it right there. And now, for the past 10 years, it's just the opposite. If I don't use a catheter, I just don't go. So what's, what's the difference there? It, yeah, you know, it, it's really an interesting, uh, you know, sort of strategy that we see uh, amongst MS patients. Uh, and that we don't, we can't really predict what type of symptoms a particular MS patient is going to going to be, and we don't see a progression like you had uh, typically. If we follow patients over a long term, it, it really depends on your lesion location, uh, on what a lot of your symptoms are are going to be. So we do see patients who do change from storage symptoms to emptying symptoms, uh, like you did, but that is not always always typical, and we can't predict. Uh, 
uh, what type of symptoms patients are going to have. But that's one of the things that we're trying to look into, the what causes one patient with MS to have storage symptoms versus another patient who has emptying symptoms, and patients to switch uh, from emptying symptoms to storage symptoms or, or vice versa. Uh, Dr. Steingall, um, I found it very fascinating because I was diagnosed pre all these medications. And are you doing studies that go back, like if people have their original MRIs and everything, can you go back and see things that you didn't see before from the MRIs? And, and the second question is, are you using any spec scans or PET scans? You know, the, the, the MRI scan, when people look at the MRI scan, they often say, Let's look at the scan. What, what's this going to cause? What problems is this going to cause? And you can't always correlate it. Sometimes you can. So you could see someone who comes in and they have optic neuritis, and you look at their optic nerve and there's a lesion on it. But if you look at your MRI scan many times, you're going to see many white spots. And you may have no symptoms. So spots and your symptoms don't always correlate it. So going back in history and looking at things doesn't really help us a lot in terms of managing what you have. What's important is let's look at the baseline and let's see what's new that develops. predict by the spots what the future disability of that person is. I can predict your disability by the number of spots and where, are, where they are located. I can't predict what your disability is going to be. If you have a lot of spots, I can tell you that you're going to be in trouble down the road, likely. Not everybody. There are people that have a scan full of spots and full of white, white matter lesions and they're doing fine. They're running a marathon. And there are people that have two spots in a very bad part of, this, of their brain or spinal cord and they're totally incapacitated. So you can't always predict how someone's going to do. But in general, the more spots you have over time, the worse you're going to do. I can't tell you how you're going to do worse. It could be cognitive problems. It could be walking. Just in general, the more spots there are, the worse you're going to do. That's what we can predict. And the spec when, scan does not help us in MS. Okay, the spec scan, what the spec scan will help us with is that some people with MS, when they have a, have a, have a, a very, very big lesion that looks like a tumor, it could be massive. It looks like they have a brain tumor. In that situation, if we do a spec scan, the scan might help us decide whether this truly is just an MS inflamed area or whether it potentially could even be a tumor. That's where a spec scan helps us. It doesn't help us diagnose MS. It helps us rule out other things. Okay. And also, when uh, I guess most people are getting glandolin when they have the MRI. What about if you've had MRIs and glandolin each time and there's been no active bright light or lesion ever, and you still have the MS symptoms. Gadolinium shows is only for one purpose. So the question is about the gadolinium, which is the dye or the contrast that we use when we do an MRI scan. What that shows us is if there's any inflammation in the brain. So each time, so the MS protocol is that we do that to see if there's inflammation. That's the main purpose for doing a scan, is to see how somebody's progressing. And as I told you before, a scan can, is not always, does not always correlate with how you feel. Somebody could come in for their annual checkup and they feel great, and we do the MRI and there's three active lesions. Or, on the other hand, somebody could come in and they feel symptoms, and we do a scan and it hasn't changed. There isn't always correlation. So typically in the MS protocol, we would do the gadolinium, uh, unless somebody was intolerant of it or had kidney problems, we do as part of our protocol the gadolinium to see if there's any MS activity going on. Hey, this is for Dr. Gomez. Um, you said that if you get a lot of UTIs that it pertains to maybe you're not emptying the bladder fully, and I get a lot. So what do you suggest that I come in and find out if that's the cause that I'm retaining some, and then what would the next step be if I do, because I'm constantly calling my GYN to say, hey, I have a UTI, constantly getting medication for the UTI. Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I recently did a talk last month, and I, I did an hour-long talk just on UTIs uh, in neurogenic bladder. So this is really a, a big topic for, for patients. Uh, most of the time, we can't find an exact cause of why you're having recurrent urinary tract infections, uh, but I highlighted that as a point that that's one of the possibilities that it could be, especially in patients with, with MS, that, that those recurrent U UTIs may be a red flag that there's something else going on with the bladder, and it should definitely be, be checked out. Okay, so then I should get one of those tests to find out if that's what it is, to know where to Cor go from there? Correct. Okay, correct. thank you. Who does? You can go first. Okay. 
Okay, well, mine's for uh, Dr. Stengo. Uh, I would like to find out about people that have MS for a number of years. I'm 25 years. I'm um, sorry, I never hear my voice on a loudspeaker. Um, anyway, um, I'm off of the ABCs for a number of years, and I'm wondering what, um, what drugs I should be looking into for, I'm pretty stable, I don't have any, any attacks or anything, so I have problems from before, loss of uh, demyelination, and possibly some uh, neuron and axon damages, rather. So, um, essentially all these medications that I showed you on that slide are medications that are approved to treat relapsing forms of MS, which is the majority of people with MS. But people that have had MS for a long time, like you, if you've had MS for 25 years, that means you had it for maybe five or six years before we had any medications at all. So people that were untreated often will go on to develop progressive MS. Even some people that are treated don't respond to the drugs and they start to progress. All these medications are for relapsing MS. We have no FDA-approved drug, even now, for progressive types of MS. We have zero for primary progressive MS, and we have one for secondary progressive MS, which is a chemotherapy drug called Novantrone, which is toxic and nobody uses it anymore. So essentially for progressive MS, we have no drugs. If you're still relapsing, if you still have a relapsing form of MS, which you could have, then we would go through all the different drugs and we would identify you and your other medical issues if you have any, and pick the right drug for you. It would be a personalized kind of decision. But when you've had MS for a long time, the longer that someone has MS, the less relapses they have. Relapses are much commoner earlier on, and as time goes by, people have less and less relapses. And so as you go on, it becomes very important to address the symptoms. That's how we make people better as time goes on. Actively treat their symptoms, manage their symptoms. The bladder is a hugely important organ in MS. MS patients, the biggest cause of MS patients declining, especially progressive MS, or dying from MS is infections. People don't often die from MS as such. They die from infections. They get bedridden, they get a urinary tract infection, it gets untreated. If I get a call on Friday night at 6.15, which by the way is a common time for me to get a call, people wait till 6.15, you know that. Let's see, it's five o'clock, let's wait till six. So you call at 6.15 and say, I feel I'm, I'm so weak I can't get out of bed. Do you have a fever? Maybe, maybe a little bit, maybe nothing. And they have secondary progressive MS. What's the first thing I say? Go to the ER and check your urine. They commonly have a urinary tract infection, causes a severe decline sometimes in someone with MS. You treat it and they're better. It's not a relapse. They could feel weak and we call that a pseudo relapse. It looks like they're having a relapse, but it's a pseudo relapse. It's important to know that. The answer to them coming to the ER and saying, I can't walk is not to give three days of steroid when they've got a bad infection, which can, spread, which can spread from their bladder into their blood, and they become septic and sick. And so it's very important to be aware of symptoms uh, as, as people have had MS for a long time. Um, excuse me, Dr. Gomez, I have a question for you. If, 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 you, if, if you don't maintain a proper relationship with your urologist, do you increase the, um, the symptoms for you to have dialysis with your, with, with your kidneys and things of that nature? You know, it, it's pretty rare for MS patients to, to progress to end-stage renal disease and, and dialysis compared to other neurologic diseases, uh, but it definitely is a possibility. So, it, so if you're retaining large volumes of urine, the pressures inside the bladder are, are increasing and you're not adequately performing the necessary catheterization, uh, it's definitely a risk factor for, for you to progress to, to renal disease. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I maintain that I, I think the urologist uh, is one of the most important physicians that you're going to have uh, amongst uh, MS, really not only for the quality of life issues, uh, but for the urinary tract infections and, and this potential for, for renal disease uh, in, in the future for you. Uh, Dr. Steingo, um about two weeks ago I got a numbness on the side of my face to the chin up to my cheek. Uh, had an MRI done, um, no lesions, uh, no stroke or anything like that. Is there a pseudotype of uh, problem that could be, could be coming from the MS that could be causing the numbness? It's kind of like I have a shot of Novocaine in my tooth, my molar, and it's just shooting up and down my side of my face. It's kind of the same answer I'm going to give you to the earlier answer, that the scan doesn't always correlate with your symptoms. 
So you could have a new symptom like that. If you get numbness in your face, it sounds like it could be an MS symptom. And the MRI scan might, might not show it. It could be a very small spot that we're not seeing. We don't see everything in the MRI scan. For example, the gray matter of the brain, which is affected by MS, you've heard me talk all night about white matter. And everybody here knows about demyelination, and myelin is in the white matter. And MS has always been said to be a white matter disease. But we know that the gray, the gray matter is significantly involved in MS. But the MRI scan capabilities for gray matter are very poor for the MRI scans. In the future, and in research, MRI scans are much better at showing things in the gray matter. So if you have something happening in your gray matter that could cause you to have this numb spot on your face, uh, we might not see it. It always, doesn't always correlate. But it's likely to be a symptom from your MS. I mean, just lo localized facial numbness, of course, people with MS can have other things, especially as they age. If you have older patients with MS, they have a higher risk for having vascular problems as well. In fact, it's been shown that in people with MS, there is a higher incidence of strokes as compared to the general population. In older patients with MS, there's a higher risk of stroke. So if an older MS patient has new symptoms, I've got to be you know, attentive to that and say, could this be something else? Especially if you have other diseases, could this be something else other than your MS? But that sounds like it could be an MS symptom. And if it's just a nuisance and it doesn't bother you, I wouldn't treat it with steroid, I would just watch it. This, I have two questions, Dr. Steingold. One of them is, I've had MS for, um, I've recognized for 10 years and 15 prior, so it's an approximate of 25 years. I wanted to know if uh, vertigo pertains uh, to heat when, it's ext when your body's extremely hot and you feel dizzy, because there's only certain times that I realize that I'm very hot, and shortly after that, I, I, I get a vertigo. Uh, and my second question would be uh, for Dr. Gomez is, um, Spray like you when you you're, you sit and you you're going to pee instead of it just being a normal uh, flow, then it's more like a spraying. What is that? I mean, it's not normal. It's it's happened like in the past three years, um, and I've noticed it it, it progresses. It's been progressing, uh, and, and and then you get up and it's almost like you need to go in and get a whole shower. So I'd like to know more or less. Should we do the heat or the spray? You can start, you can start with the heat. <laughs> I'm sorry, you said it. I, I didn't say it. I don't take credit for it. So here, so, the, the, so let's do the heat quickly. People with MS are known to be heat sensitive. The most classic example is optic neuritis. When people have had optic neuritis and then suddenly they get exposed to the heat, they go outdoors and it's too hot, and they suddenly get blurry vision. But they go back in and cool off, their blurry vision goes away. It actually has a name. Anybody here who has a name will give you a raffle prize without winning the raffles. Anybody know the name of that condition? No, not you. No, you're not counting. Anybody who stands up, I'm going to say not you. Because I don't have a raffle. Stuart has the raffles. But it's cool. This has a name. So any symptom you have, if, if vertigo is your weak spot and you get heated up, you could get vertigo. You could get facial numbness. Anything, when you, when you have an MS symptom, it's, it's like a weak spot. And when you're exposed to heat, that could happen. For some of you who might not know, there used to be a test, many of you have probably not heard of this, it was called the hot tub test. Do you know about that test? The hot tub test was before we had MRI scans. So when I was a resident, when Dr. Gomez was in kindergarten and I was a resident, uh, there was a test that was called the hot tub test. We had no MRI scans. How do you diagnose MS? So what you do is this, you take somebody down to the physical therapy department and you put them in the hot tub. And guess what happens? All kinds of things happen. The eyes look in all directions, their hands, they get weak. So the heat increased their symptoms. So we know people with MS are very heat sensitive. And in your situation, if the vertigo is the weakness, that's the symptom that it's producing. For, for the second question, I, I don't think your symptoms are related to, to MS. Uh, it's a common complaint that a lot of, of women have. Uh, and if you can think of a garden hose, if water is coming out of a garden hose, and you put your thumb over, over part of the hose, it changes sort of the diameter uh, of, the, of the spray that's coming out. And we know that with age, uh, some of the estrogen levels decrease within the, within the urethra and the vagina, which changes the tissues within there, which is often what we think a, a culprit for, the, for this symptom. So I don't think it's related to the MS that you have. It, it, it's possible. It, it's difficult without uh, actually examining you, but I, I, I'm pretty confident that it is not related to, to MS. Okay, over here. 
Um, this is for Dr. Gomez. At what time should you, or, or when, when is it right to go to uro a urologist and not just go to your primary care gynecologist or, like if your neurologist thinks, oh, that's just because you're a certain age or what have you, and then you go to your gynecologist and he says something opposite. If it continues, I mean, do I ignore them and go straight to a urologist or, or like? I, I mean, uh, I think if you're ever having a bothersome symptom, why not get it taken care of? I mean, there's really no reason not to, to get it taken care of no matter what anybody says to you. Uh, I think if you're having a bothersome symptom, then, then it should be addressed. If it bothers you, take care of it. Um, first off, uh, for the, everybody here, Excellent program. Absolutely excellent program. My hat's off to you all. This question is for Dr. Steingo. Um, you mentioned auto, other autoimmune diseases that can be uh, associated with MS or could come after MS or, or could cause MS um, and immunosuppressants. Um, assuming any additional um, pharmaceuticals that could be given to somebody that has MS that's already on an, uh, on, on auto, on immunosuppressant that's not recognized for treatment for MS, but yet seems to have control of the symptoms. Is that something best discussed with, uh, with uh, their neurologist? Yeah, I mean, you just, that, that would be something to discuss with, it, with, with your team of doctors, because if you're taking immunosuppressants for other conditions, uh, you'd want all the doctors to be, you know, on the same page and working together. There, this is very important because immunosuppressants do a number of things. There are some drugs, for example, used for rheumatoid arthritis that aggravate MS. They make the MS worse. So that, that is something that's important. Secondly, there is a drug for rheumatoid arthritis called leflunamide, which is a very important drug for rheumatoid arthritis. It's Areva. And one of the derivatives of that drug is Obagio. So one of the drugs we now use from MS is derived from a rheumatoid arthritis drug. Yet another drug you could use for MS makes, for, for rheumatoid arthritis makes MS worse. So we need to know about these drugs. Okay, a follow-up. Would you ever be one that would make it worse? No. No? Okay. You didn't wait for the mic. <laughs> I have a question before I continue going around the room. From yesteryear, when, it, when research just began for multiple sclerosis, and it was forgotten about or whatever, and, and, and life went forward and we found drugs all of a sudden under new research. Is anybody going back to the original research to see if they now know something that they didn't know then? Hey, uh, Do you understand what I'm saying? No, I don't quite understand. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some, can, can somebody explain to me, please? Say it again. Once upon a time. Yes. There was a chicken. Yes. And the chicken laid an egg. And nobody knew what was in that egg. The research began. Yes. Okay? So they started doing research and coming up with nothing at that time. Yes. Now that they know so much that they do know in research, is anybody going back to when the chicken first laid the egg to find out if they now know something that they didn't know back then? So now you Imagine can, that. He knows about the chicken. So now, now, you, now, you, now you can drive an automobile that's got power windows and power steering and automatic transmission. Is there any purpose for us to go back and look at the Model T and say, is it going to help us now? It's the same thing. I mean, research evolves. So the old research is not something, it's research, you're saying, are there things we forgot or put aside? Maybe that way you could say it. Other than that, research evolves. Something happens, then you move on to the next step. I think it's an evolution. It's step by step by step that you're learning things. Uh, I, I guess there are some things that you could say that there was a theory. Maybe you, you could refer, for example, to a theory that somebody may have had 30 years ago uh, for example, uh, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, some people had a theory that MS was a vascular disease. So you could say, could we go back and look at that and see, is it vascular? And so more recently, in recent years, there was this scam with CCSVI, where people said that MS was due to a blockage of the jugular vein, and thousands of people had the procedure, and thousands of people made a lot of money from it, and at the end of the day, the research showed it didn't, wasn't really true. So in that regard, I, I, I don't know, only if something new came up, I would say, most of that's been covered, Stuart. Thank you. Um, hello, hello, hello. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> hello? I have a question about you when you said the gelenia that causes pain in the back of my optic neuritis. And I don't know what to tell my doctor about that. Okay, so what, what gelenia does, gelenia has nothing to do with optic neuritis. 
Well, it feels well, like you know, I get scared. Yeah, what, what Jelenia does is that it can cause a condition called macular edema. So macular edema, the macula is a part, a back, part of the back part of the eye is called the macula. Yeah. And if the macula swells, we call that macular edema. That's what Jelenia can cause. It's infrequent. It's less than 1% of patients, half a percent of patients. But in certain people with other eye diseases, it's more common. So if someone's a diabetic, or if someone has a history of a condition called uveitis, then they have a higher risk of getting this macular edema. So we need to know about that. In addition to that, some people with MS have had optic neuritis, and they already have impaired vision. Uh, I saw, for example, a patient today who's young. He's 31. Uh, he's legally blind in one eye from an injury. And he, in his other eye, he has some problem with his vision from optic neuritis. So Jelenia is not a drug we are going to consider for him because we don't want to do anything to mess with his eyes. If you have pain in the eye, this is different. Then you need to see the ophthalmologist because macular edema causes blurry vision, but it doesn't cause pain like optic neuritis does. If there is pain in your eye, you need to see an ophthalmologist. And remember, as I said before, people with MS can have other things wrong with them. You can have pain in the eye from other diseases, and like glaucoma. I get migraines. Coma. Migraines also. Yes. Right, like right now. Right you can now. have migraine, cause a headache or pain behind the eye. Yes, other things can be considered too. Another question? Okay. Anybody else on this side of the room? No. All right. We go to the other side. Two more questions, okay? <laughs> Dr. Stongo, I recently started seeing a new <coughs> neurologist and asked him if Ampira might help me with my walking problem. And he said, yeah, yeah, let's, let's give it a try. I uh, received the medication, read through the information, saw the possibility of seizures and other type of serious uh, allergic reactions that may require medical emergency. Uh, I then saw him a second time and brought these to his attention, and he basically said, well, do you have a history of seizures? I said, no. He goes, you should have no problem with it. So I'm trying to figure out whether my fears are unfounded, and, and I live by myself, so I don't have the ability of someone to help me if I do have these allergic reactions. So are there other questions that I might be able to pose to this neurologist, or is it something that's unfounded? Do you have a history with Ampira and your patients that, you, that use this medication? Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is, is, is correct. When you have any medication, and Ampira is the prime example of this, uh, you can look at with your physician or your neurologist two types of side effects. The first kind of side effect you look at, let's take Ampira as an example, and it's relevant right now, is that Ampira has what we call common side effects. And one of the commonest side effects of Ampira is urinary tract infections. For some reason, in the clinical trial with Ampira, 12% of patients got urinary tract infections compared to 8% of the placebo patients. So there's a slight increased risk of urinary tract infections. There was some dizziness. Uh, there were some headaches. There were some sleep disorders. Uh, there were a few other common side effects that are not serious. They all occur generally under 10%. And the way I like to look at that is to go over it. There's a table which you can get in the Ampira brochure. And it tells you all the side effects, and it tells you most of them are under 10%. What's the good news? That means over 90% of people really don't get them. So we don't have to worry too much about the common side effects, only to know about them. But then there's a second series of side effects that you have to know about with every drug, and those are called the serious side effects, or serious adverse events. And seizure is one such event that can occur with Ampira. So this comes from studies in the past when Ampira was used in a different form, and people were given very high doses. And it's clearly been shown that if people take too high of a dose of Ampira, there is a risk for seizure. Now that's superimposed on the fact, the important things you need to know about are that people with MS have a higher risk for seizures. It's a brain disease. There is a higher risk for seizures to begin with in someone with MS. Secondly, there are other drugs that you could be taking that increase the risk for seizures. I'll give you common examples. Wellbutrin is an antidepressant that increases the risk for seizures. Tramadol, Ultram is a pain medication that increases the risk for seizures. So you could have an MS patient who is a sitting duck for a seizure. They have MS, they're on tramadol for pain, they're on wellbutrin as an antidepressant, now you add Ampira and they have a seizure. So we have to look at the combinations. It goes back to what I was saying earlier, harping on it, how important it is for us to know all your drugs. Other than that, I would say the incidence of seizures, if you have no prior seizures and you're not on those drugs, your risk of seizures is low. It's higher than the general population, but it's still low. And I would say if you have no risk, and none of those other risks I talked about, it's still something we would try. Uh, Ampira. Sure. You're welcome. Dr. Stango, um, my friend Ellie, that also has MS, called me very excited the other day about a program she saw on television that in Israel they're studying um, patients with spinal cord injury that actually, uh, you know, they 
I don't know if it's all ro robotic. It's on the web. It's on the web. Okay. Any any idea when something like that is coming? This person started walking, going up the stairs. Anything? Have you heard anything? No. I mean, I've probably read as much as your friend or as much as you. I don't, I don't know any more about it. There's a lot of research. I mean, there's great spinal cord research in Miami. So there is research going on, and, and there's stem cell, stem cell transplants, and there's stem cell transplants in Israel uh, and in Chicago, and people are trying all these things. But I don't, I don't have any more information on what you just are speaking about. No. Thank you for that. By the way, uh, you can find that article on our blog. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, before I get fired, uh, when I was checking everybody in, I gave you all a piece of paper, evaluation form. If you all fill it out, as we're doing this, I'll be picking them up from you, and thank you. Great. All right, so we've come to the end of this program, and I want to thank everybody. I want to thank the doctors for coming out here and speaking, and I hope that you all had a good time. By the way, no, we're not going to do the raffle yet. We've got to wait a minute. Firstly, again, I want to say about the improv, remember, fundraiser. I have tickets here. If anybody wants to come up and get them after the program, we'd love to see you at that event. Come and laugh with us, okay? Remember, laughter is the best medicine. And again, I want to personally thank Genzyme, a Santa Fe company, for providing us again with this grant to do tonight's program. Because again, we cannot do these programs without the support of the pharmaceutical industry. They provide and help us to provide all the programs that we are providing, whether in Florida or now outside in the Southeast United States as well. So I'd like to thank them. Thank you. All right.